Okay, good morning everyone and thanks very much for joining us. Um, so in this session, uh, which is a question and answer session on our science, technology and engineering subjects, we've got our directors of studies here who are available to answer any of your questions. So please don't feel as though any question is a silly question um, or there's anything that's sort of off the table. You can really do feel free to ask anything that, that you feel is relevant to understanding and, and, and making sense of our admissions process. Um, we are recording this session, um, but that doesn't mean that you as participants are being recorded. So your cameras are not switched on, your microphones are not switched on either. So it's just our happy faces in front of you that are being recorded. So we're all thrilled about that, obviously. And we will make that recording available to you after, uh, after this session using the email address that you provided to register for it. So I'm going to kick off um, just by asking a few general questions of our panel, and that will hopefully give those of you time who want to think of questions to ask our directors of studies to post them in the Q&A box. So there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can type your questions, and I'll be monitoring that and, and I'll let you know uh, whether your question is going to be answered live or whether I'm going to type a response to it. The majority of questions we will, we will answer live. Please don't use the chat function because uh, my colleague Sophie is going to be using that chat function to post relevant links to, to um, follow up the different kinds of things that we might be referring to. Although obviously if you use it accidentally, it's not, it's not dramatically problematic or anything like that. Okay, so um, we'll get going uh, by doing a few introductions. So I've already started off by talking at you and I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna pause briefly to just explain who I am and why I'm talking to you. So I'm Catherine, I'm Sydney's admissions director, and that means that I'm responsible for managing the admissions process in the college and making sure that your experience as applicants and our experience as those assessing those applications go smoothly. So I take part in discussions with the collected directors of studies uh, here, uh, and together we make the decisions about who to call for interview and who to ultimately make offers to. My own subject is geography, which is slightly pretending to be a STEM subject today. Um, so if there are any geographers here, don't panic. Um, we're, 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 we're still among friends. Okay, thanks very much. Right, so Matthew, can I turn to you next? Uh, hello, uh, my name is Matthew Ireland. I am a computer scientist. Uh, I specialize in the interface between hardware and software in computer systems. And I direct studies in computer science at Sydney Sussex. And I guess we'll go on to uh, explore what that means a little during this session. Um, can I ask Andrew to go next, please? Hi there, I'm Andrew Fluitt. I'm a director of studies in Sydney in engineering. And engineering is a very broad church. It has many disciplines within it. I'm actually an electrical engineer myself. Um, so that's where my research is. Uh, and I also supervise in electrical engineering as well. Fantastic. Sid, would you like to go next? Yeah, hi, I'm Sid Lawrence. I'm Director of Studies for Medicine. Um, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, which means bones and joints. And uh, also a sort of sci clinician scientist. So I spend some of my time doing research uh, into limb development. Uh, so it's, thanks for attending. Um, welcome any questions later. I look forward to answering them. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Harriet, would you like to finish? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Harriet, Harriet Groom, um, and I'm Director of Studies for Biological Natural Sciences at um, Sydney Sussex. So some of you who are interested in natural sciences might know it's divided into biological and physical. So I look after the biological people. Um, and I also teach one of the first year subjects, biology of cells, but my research interest is in viruses. Um, so I'm enjoying a bit of a, a bit of fame at the moment <laughs> from that. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so while we're waiting for some questions to come in from our participants, um, I'd like to invite each of you to explain what this thing that we've just talked about is. And Sophie's just put a little link to it in the chat as well. So we've all described ourselves as directors of studies, and this can seem a slightly strange title um, and it's it's something something unique in the in the in some in the Cambridge system so can you say a little bit each of you about what being a director of studies is and what that makes your relationship with students as um Sid I'll talk to you first yeah I think I see it really as two things first of all you're one of the teaching staff so uh you, you deliver weekly teaching to the students um uh in small groups and um, following on from that, your, uh, I think my main role is to ensure that all the academic needs of the students are met. 
which is quite a wide ranging thing. So ensuring all, te all subjects, be they large or small parts of the course are covered by a supervisor and that that teaching is, uh, is that the students are happy with that teaching. And then that all other resources that are present, so things like library books, so no students uh, should have to buy any textbooks, we should have enough books to cover uh, all the major subjects. Um, and then finally, really pastoral, because you're seeing the students every week to teach them. So hopefully you're um, someone that they can approach with problems, be they academic or non-academic. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I see the role. Thank you. Does anyone want to add in anything to that? Yeah, can I sort of, I think my aim as the Director of Studies is to make sure you get the most out of your time in Cambridge. And uh, I think it's tempting when you're, particularly as an A-level student, you think the aim in life at the moment is to get to university. But actually university is a stepping stone onto the wonderful career that you have beyond that. And so I see it as being part of a journey with you for the time you're here. We start off by looking backwards at the transition you make from school to university and make sure that's a success. And then as the years go by, we turn around and look forward to the transition you make from university to whatever it is you want to do afterwards. And I see it as a really important part of my role. So in, in uh, engineering in Sydney, we're unusual. Actually, we have a system where the director of studies follows you through all four years. So really do make that journey with you and see you sort of hopefully go off and do wonderful things and discover the wonderful world that's out there and how you can play your part in it. Fantastic. Any other comments on being a director of studies? Back in. Perhaps just to say, um, but really expanding on Andrew's point, the director of studies is the person who gets to know you as an individual really well over your three years in Cambridge or four years in Cambridge, so that they can uh, act as an academic mentor uh, during that time. So they'll be able to give you personalized guidance on how to get to the next stage of your journey as Andrew was describing. Um, but also through bi-termly or more regular meetings, uh, they'll be trying to give you the guidance uh, more broadly around your subject as to how to develop as a person, how to develop your thinking and learning skills, um, and how to uh, become a professional in your field uh, when your degree finishes. Wonderful. Harriet, do you want to finish? Yeah, sure. And I guess to kind of follow on from those two points where that journey kind of starts even before you come. So now we're thinking about getting ready to say hello uh, to next year's students and get them, particularly in natural sciences, we have, there are quite a few choices to be made, different subjects to choose at each stage. So helping people make those decisions. Um, and so, and then when people are coming to the end of their three years, thinking about that next step, giving some advice, maybe even some the advantage of having a, a specialist in your subject kind of looking after you is also that they can perhaps even point you towards labs, for example, where you might enjoy a PhD or I don't know how being a patent attorney can be really exciting. That's what my part three is going on to do. Sadly, I want him to stay, but he can easily. So it's all part of that big journey, as Andrew and, and Matthew were saying. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We've got a few really good questions coming in um, that I'll try and split into uh, categories that broadly go together. So there's one that's uh, specifically about being a director of studies, um, and it's a very good question. And it asks, does it matter if our interests in our chosen subject are different than the, what the director of studies specialises in? So who would like to take that? Do you want me to say, I mean, in engineering. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have quite a large fellowship in engineering, so I'm one of five other fellows. If there is a really specialist question, I can get a specialist answer for you from one of my colleagues. But most of the stuff, I think you'll find a director of studies is sufficiently experienced within the breadth of their subject, beyond their own research area, to be able to tackle almost anything. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you very much indeed. OK, so we're going to change tack a little bit now um, and move on to asking a little bit about work experience and what role work experience might play within our admissions process. Um, so we might get um, some slightly different answers here from the subjects that we have represented. So I'm going to begin with the most obvious, and that's it. Thanks, Catherine. I think um, 
sometimes it's tempting to certainly when i applied to medicine it's tempting to see work experience as a tick box exercise to say oh well, they won't they won't interview me if i haven't got work experience but i always encourage people to flip that around and say well if you haven't done a nice broad um, amount of work experience then it's a pretty massive decision to be making to study medicine which is you know six year degree and then basically a lifetime of work and i think from our admissions point of view um, the, the biggest mistake we can make is to give someone a place at a medical school who actually doesn't really want to study medicine and ends up unhappy studying medicine because that's just a disaster for everyone and most importantly for the student themselves so I think really um, see work experience as something that's making you more or less certain about a huge life decision and that's that's all you have to think about really on that front and um, yeah that's really the main thing. That's fantastic thank you so I'll go to computer science next I think so Matthew. Um, I, I agree with everything that uh, Sid said, and I think that it applies uh, just as much to uh, my field as it would to medicine. Um, I'd possibly add two more points, and that's uh, what we want you to get, or, and the sooner you get it, uh, the better, really. So whether you do this during internships, during your undergraduate degree, or whether you do it during work experience, for uh, your uh, undergraduate degree is just exposure to real problems that you have to solve in the field. And this will help you to think, it will help you to realize what is relevant and what is important uh, when you're going on to design your own um, systems, be they computational in nature or not. Um, and uh, it, it really helps you to refine your problem solving process which is useful both in real life and also in academic problems. Um, the ability to break down large problems into uh, small manageable chunks and then solve each of those chunks in turn. Um, th that, that's useful, whatever you want to go on to do. Um, and then the other aspect of work experience is really it helps to develop your maturity um, as a person. And the more mature you are when you arrive at university, um, the more you'll be able to engage in the academic discussions uh, that are so useful uh, to you during your time here. I think um, during your time in Cambridge, your interactions with other students, uh, with, your, your, with your peers, are almost as important as all the lectures and supervisions that you go through. And sort of the more maturity you have when you arrive in Cambridge, the more exposure you've had to real world problems, um, the more you'll bring to those academic discussions and the more you'll get out of them also. Um, well, what we'd look for in work experience is that you've done something well so we don't want you to uh, necessarily get uh, five jobs and uh, just go through each of those jobs and then list them in your personal statement. Um, so I think what you'd get the most out of, certainly if you're applying for computer science, and so what might come across better in your personal statement also, uh, is uh, if you do a small number of projects very well. Um, be those projects part of work, formal work experience, be they part of volunteering um, in a, a university research department or a company, um, or they be just personal projects uh, that you yourself undertake. Um, we want you to uh, investigate something that you're working on in that work experience. We'd want you to do a large amount of reading around the thing that you were working on, so that when you were doing it in your job, uh, you were taking a sensible approach to solving the problem you were trying to solve. Um, and then we'd like to see you reflecting on what you've done in that work experience as well, um, both as you're doing it so that you can improve the work that you're doing, um, but also afterwards. So we know that if you are tackling similar projects when you come to be an undergraduate, um, then you've learned something from what you've done in your work experience. So uh, when you come to do something similar again, you're going to do it better than you did it the first time. Um, and those are all things we'd want to see you getting out of your work experience. Um, so my summary would be, yes, work experience is good, but what's more important is what you get out of doing that work experience. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Matthew. Andrew, you, you have an extra comment. 
Yeah, in engineering, there's a requirement that you do a, an industrial placement for at least eight weeks before you complete the third year of the degree. And that's because it comes back to the point I was making earlier about university being a stepping stone onto what comes beyond. You're getting the academic part of uh, the training you need to become a chartered engineer through our course. And that's run one of the requirements. The other thing I would say is actually one of the beauties of the engineering course in Cambridge is that we admit you as a general engineer. And so you have the opportunity to change which discipline you actually want to specialise in in the third and fourth year. And work experience is a great way of discovering what it's really like to be, for example, a civil engineer or really be an electrical engineer. And it gives you a chance either to decide that's right for you or to decide actually you prefer something else. Harriet. Um, Harriet, um, I, I can't hear you, I'm afraid, sorry. <laughs> How about now? Is that okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah. And I think the reality is that those coming into natural sciences may be thinking about being able to do laboratory work experience. And, and the reality is that, um, especially at the moment, the opportunities for that are, are few and far between, especially depending on what your context is. You may not be able to devote your summer to going into a lab or, or whatever, but there are plenty of, of opportunities and in your school work, for example, if you might be doing an extended essay or something along those lines, or just a little bit of reading outside of school, there are plenty of opportunities for you to show us what we're really interested in, which is what you're interested in, where your passions lie, and and being able to talk about problems as as the others have been saying so don't feel like not have <laughs> coming to the interview without that on your personal statement is going to disadvantage you we want to just to see your passion passion for the subject thanks so much for that harriet and i'll just i'll just add for clarity that the only subjects that we actually require work experience for as part of your application are medicine and veterinary medicine for all other subjects You've heard a little bit from our directors of studies on how it might be useful and how it might show your engagement with your subject beyond what you've done at school, but there are plenty of other ways in which you can do that too. And we'll move on to talking about that now because seamlessly there is a question that's just come in about um, personal statements and what you can put in a personal statement and how you can make your application stand out. So a, a classic question, we get this question a lot. So. Can I come back to you, Harriet, um, and ask you to say a little bit about, about what you look for in natural sciences personal statements? Um, yeah, I guess it's sort of slightly easier to start with things that we're not <laughs> looking for. Um, I'm not, um, you don't, it doesn't have to be, a, um, you know, an amazing piece of prose. Don't worry about getting those long words in there or anything like that. Um, although if you can get someone else to proofread it, that always helps. Although don't, <laughs> don't worry if there are spelling errors in there. Um, so what I'm looking for really is someone who is clearly excited about what they're applying for, someone who, and, and in natural sciences, we know that you're not necessarily going to be interested in one particular thing. You don't have to be a born neuroscientist as soon as, you know, from at the, the get go. And that's the advantage of natural sciences. Um, so just communicating that you're interested in it and showing us an example, some evidence of, that that's the case. So maybe you've read a book and you can comment on it. Um, or, or even just an article in a newspaper or something you've seen on TV. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to subscribe to magazines or something like that, TED Talk, something like that. Um, so something that shows that you um, are interested in your subject. Um, and if there is anything kind of Cambridge specific, um, you know that there's a section of the application form that you can then communicate more specifically around the natural sciences. I know some people for natural sciences will be applying for specific subjects elsewhere, and we do understand that. Um, so don't worry if you need to be selling a particular subject hard in your personal statement for elsewhere, that's, that's fine. That's lovely, thank you. Any other personal statement top tips that people would like to chip in with? Andrew, you were first and then Sid. <laughs> Yeah, I just say, I think in engineering, engineering is all around you in the real world. And so it's about showing what is it that how have you engaged with engineering in some way to show that's that really what you want to do and why you don't want to do natural sciences. OK, so because there is a, a difference between the two in terms of the philosophy behind the course. So what is it that means you want to be an engineer? And it could be that you've visited, visited somewhere, you've read something, you have got to work at placement, maybe just for a week or so, or you visit the company. 
there are lots of opportunities out there. Engineers are very keen to get more people to be engineers. So it is worth dropping a line. If you see sort of something going on around you, drop a line in and say, I'm thinking of doing engineering, can I come and visit for a day? And that's a great thing to then put on your personal statement. Do make sure that you can back up what you put on your personal statement in an interview, because it then doesn't look, if you said, oh, actually, I'm really interested in X. And there's a nice opening question. We ask you, tell us more what you know about X then. And you can't answer that. So you do need to make sure it's credible what you're putting on there as well. That is excellent advice. Sid, would you like to come in next? Yeah, pretty much a combination of what's already been said. Um, don't, don't put too much pressure on it because um, as Harriet said, you know, people have different resources and it doesn't have to be this wonderful uh, essay on why why you want to study medicine. So don't don't worry too much about it, basically. And then following on from Andrew, just be honest. So um, don't make make you know feel like you have to put all these things on the page, even if you're not confident about talking about them. Just just be really honest about why you study medicine. And then, as I was saying, with work experience, what's made you as certain as you can be that medicine is right for you. And that's pretty much, I mean, that's my personal view on, on personal statements, just an honest reflection of what you've done and why medicine's the choice for you. So yeah, just don't worry too much and don't, don't try and ram everything in there. <laughs> Good advice, thank you. Matthew, you cut, you're, you're, you're last on the list, I'm afraid, but have you got anything to add on this? Uh, no, I, I'd, I'd agree with uh, <laughs> everything you said so far. Um, and perhaps just to add, I, I, lists are boring. Um, I have to read a lot of these personal statements and um, if you just uh, list everything that you've done then uh, sort of anyone can do that. Um, anyone can go along to a cyber security competition, anyone can read a book, uh, anyone can attend a lecture. Great if you've done those things, um, it, it shows that you are engaging but also um, you haven't had to really achieve anything to attend a lecture. Um, I, I don't know whether you went to the lecture and sat on your phone all the way through it um, and then left again. Uh, so if you can write something about what you got out of the experience on your personal statement, then that's far more valuable and it tells me a lot more about you as a person. Um, so uh, sort of the formula that I do see quite often in personal statements and I really like is when someone explains something that they've done, they reflect on what they've got out of it, whether it was going to a lecture, reading a book, writing a computer program, but then they also say how that experience has caused them to do something differently in the future. Um, and that really shows that you understand the significance of what you've done and that you can use your past experiences to inform future experiences. Now, obviously, you have to actually do that to be able to write it in your personal statement, but um, that's also very good for character development. Um, I think uh, in terms of the personal statement, don't stress too much about it. Um, if you can write something that makes me think while I'm reading it, then that's a very positive sign and it's going to make you stand out. Um, equal, but don't just say something to be controversial. Um, you have to reflect on um, what you're saying, you have to think it through, and um, it has to be absolutely right, at least. It has to be correct, uh, even if it's uh, up for debate. Um, so that uh, if it does make me think, that will certainly make you stand out as someone that um, I'm looking forward to interviewing and uh, discussing uh, this personal statement with you. Uh, equally, um, and uh, it, it, uh, this particular case wasn't at Sydney Sussex, so uh, that broadens the field, but um, I, I did admit one of the students who wrote the worst personal statement I've ever read. Um, it was uh, just a collection of um, things that I, I think were meant to be controversial but just came across very badly um, and it really wasn't well thought through. Um, really, uh, he hadn't reflected on what he was writing. Um, but uh, even so, we invited him to uh, interview because his uh, other, but the other parts of his academic record were very good. And at interview, he excelled um, and he went on to do very well in the tripos. So the personal statement is one part of our assessment. It's important. It's something that can count for you if done well, but it's not the be all and end all if it does go wrong. 
Fantastic. Some really good advice there across all subjects. So I'm sure I'm sure you'll uh, have plenty to think about there. I once read a personal statement that was written entirely as a haiku, and I would not recommend that as a, as a way to stand out. That was that was not great. OK, right. Moving on. Um, we've got a couple of subject specific questions here uh, that I'll move on to in a moment. But first, before we do that, there are a couple of nice general ones, I think, that link into what we've just been talking about. Um, so the first is. Uh, what opportunities are there to explore your academic interests further while at university? And I think that's a question that, that we can all answer in some way. Um, so who hasn't gone first yet? Andrew, do you want to go first? So I think the short answer is lots. And I mean, again, in engineering, it's all about doing things. And uh, it's amazing how quickly you can actually make a real difference. So there are lots of engineering based societies that you can get stuck into. Uh, so we have an eco racing one where you sort of uh, get to sort of make a solar power vehicle. Um, there's a bioengineering one, but students can come up with ones themselves. So I had some engineers a few years ago who uh, decided they wanted to make some uh, wristbands for the May ball, uh, which were all Bluetooth enabled and would change colour depending on who else you had been with. So there are some beacons around. So if you went to a particular stage, that said, this is the blue stage. So if you've been there, or everyone's wristbands would start to be blue, but would depend on where they've been previously. And you can get these interesting colour effects. And that was entirely a student-led project. A few people got together and said, can we do this? There's some funds available to make this sort of thing happen. Uh, I was delighted to be their senior treasurer to provide some sort of uh, academic input um, and they just ran with it. So you know, basically if you can find some other people to do stuff with you can make it happen. There's also some more formal stuff in engineering. We do what are called Europe's undergraduate research opportunities programs where academics pitch summer projects that you can then apply to do. You even get paid for doing them um, to find out a bit more about the research that's going on and in the fourth year of the degree uh, you actually do a project which makes up about half of the entire degree for that year uh, where you're embedded in a research group actually doing sort of real research with a uh, with my colleagues uh, and myself and that can lead to published papers it can lead occasionally to a patent uh, it's led in one case to me doing a subsequent project with the person who's gone off to a company and then we've done a, a quite a large scale project with them afterwards uh, related to their fourth year project so it can be a real opener of lots of doors. Fantastic, thank you Andrew. Harriet, can I come to you next? Um, so yes, in natural sciences, quite similar to engineering in that they, you have the opportunities to explore your interests kind of through the nature of the degree really, allowing that gradual kind of exploration and special, specialization over the three or four years. Again, there's another, there's also a fourth year where you can do a lab placement, which can be great for exploring those interests. But um, again, lots of other um, mechanisms for doing so. Um, there are lectures, there's the Cambridge Philosophical Society do these like amazing lectures, that, um, which are really kind of historical scientific society, which is great. There's, there's a lecture, if you wanted to just go to seminars, you could do it all, all day, every day, if you really wanted to. Um, and, and that can be on anything, the most minute detail through to massive broad things. Um, and then lots of student run societies as well, which are great. And then in Sydney itself, we have Wilson, the Wilson Society, which uh, they put on um, speakers. We had a dino day in, in um, COVID where we uh, um, had a speaker who did uh, the Walking with Dinosaurs program. And um, so it's really, it's, it's fun and really interesting. Fantastic, thank you. Sid? Yeah, I think that the first thing to say is um, in uh, Cambridge, in the third year of medicine, you become a natural, well, in most cases, you become a natural scientist for the year. Um, so that's obviously a fantastic way to broad to focus on an area that's interested you. And most students will do a subject that's interested them as part of the medicine course, such as perhaps biochemistry or pathology, and do it in more detail. Um, although there is a bit of scope, we had two students this year doing management studies, which is obviously important from a healthcare point of view, and they actually excelled. Um, so there's that. And then just more broadly, perhaps one thing that hasn't been mentioned is um, summer, summer placements and the funding available for those sorts of things uh, at Sydney. So two of my uh, second year students are very interested in um, development and embryology and 
uh, genetics and things like that. And so they both, I think, got £500 each through college through apl applying for financial support to stay around uh, Cambridge and, and do some research with a group for a, a few weeks. Um, had another first year student who's gone to Sheffield to, to do a sort of research program there. And again, we um, financially supported that. So that's perhaps just one extra thing in how we can really support um, students' aspirations to study um, particular areas that have really um, grabbed their interest. So yeah, and, and um, as Andrew said, just lots and lots of opportunities. It's, it's almost infinite, really. Um, it's a great, great opportunity. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, uh, yes, so I think the first thing to say is that our course is really good. Um, our course is very broad in the first year and it allows you to progressively specialize through later years. So whatever your academic interests are, the first thing you can do to further them is do the course really well uh, and invest yourself in the course because there will be a subject um, as part of, we call it the tripos, the undergraduate degree, um, as part of the tripos that will perfectly align with your skill sets, whatever they are. And probably the most valuable thing you can do to further that academic interest is engage with all of the course, but particularly with that part. And alongside the course, we have supervisions, which are small group tutorials. And for a large number of those supervisions, uh, you will be in a maybe one-to-one -one or two-to-one group, um, possibly three-to-one, uh, with uh, an expert in the field. And um, different subjects approach supervisions in different ways. I think this will be one of the more varied parts of um, the, the Cambridge undergraduate degrees. Um, but in most subjects, you will have an opportunity to explore the areas that you're really interested in further with your supervisor during the supervision. Um, and I mean, just the opportunity of spending um, an hour or more per week with a leading expert in the thing that you're really interested in is amazing. Um, and that's one of the things that, if not unique to Cambridge, um, I think Cambridge does a, a lot better than many of the universities. Um, the, more broadly, uh, the area around Cambridge is known as Silicon Fen, by analogy to uh, its counterpart, uh, Silicon Valley in California. And um, this sort of just shows how many um, people there are who are at a very high level in their field in this area. Um, and all of those people are enthusiastic, but certainly most of those people are enthusiastic about inspiring the next generation and will be keen to engage with you during the course of your studies. Um, for example, last year we had one first year undergraduate um, who, was got, who got very interested in one of his first year courses um, and went on over the summer to publish an academic paper um, doing some academic research with the lecturer of that course. So really, if you're interested in something and you're good at it, then you're going to have the opportunity to take that further, to engage with the people who are part of this community um, uh, and uh, work on that area together. Slightly more formally, um, in Sydney, Sussex, uh, we also have a computer science talks series. Um, and this is for second year undergraduates uh, who want to uh, explore their area of interest in more detail. So what we do is let you uh, choose the subject of a talk. Then we find you a mentor who will help you um, do research into that area to find out more about it. Um, and once you've done some work on this, once you've found out more about your chosen topic, um, then we ask you to put together a talk so that you can inform the other members of your year, and, and perhaps uh, more broadly beyond Sydney, um, uh, about this topic. So you're clearly enthusiastic about it, you've done a lot of work to find out more about it, um, you've been guided in doing that work by a mentor who is um, perhaps a leader in that field, um, and then you'll be able to pass on your experience to the other members of your cohort. Um, and likewise, you'll be attending their talks and learning um, about their areas of interests um, delivered by 
those people who are really passionate about those areas. So just to echo what everyone else has said, really, um, there's a lot you can do to further your uh, academic interests while in Cambridge. Fantastic. Thank you all very much. Um, so we've got another, we've got a couple of um, quite subject specific questions now. So one for natural sciences and one on maths. So I'll take the maths if that's all right. Um, and then we've got another broad question for reflection to, to deal with. Chris. So the maths question um, is how many students do we take a year for maths? Is this a comparatively small or large cohort and roughly the applicants per place? So generally speaking in maths, we take between six and eight students a year. And this actually in much the same way as most subjects in Sydney is, is kind of medium sized across the university. Um, so Sydney is a, a moderately small college. It's by no means the smallest, but it's certainly not the largest either. We take about 105 undergraduates every year um, and we take them across 30 different subjects. So maths within Sydney is actually a moderate, to large uh, cohort. Natural sciences is our biggest single cohort and engineering is, is a medicine up there as well. But maths takes about six to eight students each year. Roughly speaking, across uh, uh, maths and most other STEM subjects, the applicant to place ratio is about five to one. Um, so hopefully that is useful to you, not just if you're doing maths, but if you're doing other subjects too. Um, we have a question on natural sciences uh, and it's about um, I suppose the degree of specialisation um, that you can do within natural sciences. Um, and it notes that on the website in natural sciences, um, you can take a, a broad spectrum part two subject. And, and the questioner would like to know a little bit more about this and what that means for questions around specialisation and sort of future prospects in terms of doing research. Sure. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for this very good question. Um, and, you know, I've been banging on about the fact that natural science is a very broad subject and, and perhaps by implication um, that suggests that it's not the depth is lost. And, and in fact, the reality is that's not the case. Um, mathematical biology um, and then you will gradually specialise in your part two, which is your third year, you will do um, a single subject. So that's what we mean by our kind of broad spectrum specialty subject in, in your third year. And that could be biochemistry, pathology, pharmacology, just zoology. There's lots and lots of different types. And you certainly do specialize at that point. And you're, it's kind of reaching a pinnacle of, of specialization in that third year, which you can take to another step in your fourth year if in some subjects. Um, but I wouldn't say at all that you are still being exceedingly broad at that time. And so part of that final year will be a research project where you're really going to be drilling down. You're going to be, <clears throat> um, you know, amongst the world experts on that particular question, which is a fantastic and amazing feeling. Um, and that will be complemented by in that particular subject, you will then get to choose modules that suit your research interests. And um, uh, you know, um, people who've done the natural sciences course are exceedingly employable um, if you choose to go on to a job um, straight away, either in science or, or outside of science, um, and also are, you know, sought after for postgraduate um, research as well, should you wish to. I've got people going on to public health masters, PhDs, completely other, completely different things. So that's, that's not something to be concerned about. If you have any further questions, do get in touch. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Andrew. Can I just sort of say, because uh, this engineering, your general engineering course is in a similar position, actually, here. I think the thing I would say is you're in a really fortunate position that across UK universities, you have an amazing selection of degrees to choose from. And Cambridge is not necessarily the right one for everyone. They all have their different strengths and weaknesses. I think for engineering, it's a particular strength of ours that we have a general engineering course but you will not get the same degree of specialism that you would get if you studied say civil engineering for all four years what we're equipping you with is a breadth of knowledge that you would not get from a specialist course and we're giving you the tools to be able to pick up specialist understanding at the right point further down in your career but it is horses for courses i would say so do look and think actually is this the right course for me Cambridge isn't necessarily the right one for everyone. I think it's the right one in general engineering for lots of people, but you've got to ask yourself that question in sort of a really reflective way. And again, I think that comes back to what we're talking about with personal statements. If you've done that, then that really shows through in your personal statement as well. 
Brilliant. So we've got two more questions that I'd like to get to in the next three minutes. So we're going to have to be pretty speedy about it. Um, first one's a very quick one. Uh, Matthew, can you tell us a little bit about the admissions assessments arrangements in computer science? Uh, yes, indeed. So admissions assessments uh, form two broad parts. Uh, we have pre-interview assessment and at interview assessment. Um, the pre-interview assessment is known as the Tamua. Um, it was known as the C Tamua in previous years, but it's changed to the Tamua this year. Um, and that will be sat in your school. Um, that's the same across all colleges, no matter where you apply. Um, and you must make sure that uh, your school registers you for the Tamua in order to be able to uh, sit that pre-interview assessment. And we'll use the results of that pre-interview assessment uh, together with all of your other academic background in deciding whether to uh, invite you to interview or not. Um, the other form of uh, assessments we give you are at interview assessments. Um, this will likely be a combination of um, interviews and in some colleges they'll also require you to sit a written test and I believe this is what the specific question was asking about, um, the CSAT, uh, which is a form of at interview assessment that some colleges will ask you to sit when you come to interview. Um, not all colleges require you to do that, and Sydney Sussex is not one of the colleges that requires you to do that particular written test. That test, the CSAT, does have a large number of online resources associated with it. And to sort of segue into what I think is the next question, um, actually, um, the CSAT uh, provides a lot of online resources um, to do with problem solving, to do with answering computational questions. Um, and that's an excellent online resource to um, use for practicing and practice your skills ready for interview, whether or not the uh, college that you're applying to requires you to sit the CSAT. Um, and the other follow up question, uh, computer science students are not required to sit STEP. Um, in general. Um, in very, very rare cases, uh, your offer may have a step requirement if you have not got another qualification to demonstrate some skill that, that we are looking for. But um, Catherine, I can't think of a case that we've done that for in the last five years or not. So no. basically the answer is no. <laughs> Fantastic. So just as a, a closing comment from yourselves, Andrew and Sid, um, one of the final questions that's come through is for suggestions for resources that someone could look at in your subject. So what would be your favourite one to point an applicant to, to, to explore their subject beyond, beyond what they're given at school? Andrew, you are muted, so I'll come to you first. <laughs> Join as a student one of the professional engineering institutions, something like the IMECE or the IET. It's really low cost. They will send you a, a monthly magazine about what's going on in the area. And uh, there's information there about other meetings and things you can go to. They're really keen that students join. It's really low cost. Look online. The IET.org for the IET. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Sid. Yeah, similarly, there are royal colleges within medicine for <clears throat> each of the main sort of branches of medicine, like surgery, um, uh, physicians, general practitioners. So there's lots on their websites. But I think more broadly, just anything that interests you, just follow it. If you're in biology, studying biology and you studied the heart, just, just follow it. There's never been more resources online at your fingertips. So don't worry too much about formal sort of approved things and just follow your interest and um and again if if you've studied the heart and biology and it was of no interest whatsoever then um you know think about that and and wonder why and um but comes back to my first point on work experience really and making sure it's the subject for you that's fantastic so that brings us to the end of this session and we have kept to time remarkably successfully so thank you very much to all of the panelists for their time and thank you to all of our attendees as well for your excellent questions um, those of you who are interested in sydney's interview workshop that follows immediately after this um, on a different zoom link which i've put in the chat or which you can find on our website under the uh, today's program so thank you ever, ever so much for your time um, and good luck with your applications bye